Ei oo. George, I've forgotten. Do I gavel? All right. Good afternoon, and welcome, everybody, to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Quentin Hardy. I'm the head of editorial at Google Cloud, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's program. The title of Jill Abramson's book is Merchants of Truth, The Business of News and the Feist for Facts. Most responses have been about journalism and the state of the world, or judgments of Abramson herself, which we'll get to in a minute. But there's a key point smack in the title that I feel is not getting significant attention. Merchants of truth, business of news. This is a book fundamentally about a crisis in the business of information and specifically breaking information and news. So let's talk about what the news business was. What it was was fantastic for the longest time, my gosh. <laughs> Newspapers controlled most of the time and space of meaningful daily information in people's lives for decades. The news, the movie listings, the school lunches, the comics, the social events, the life of the community, the life of the world, traveled through a finite number of institutions in most towns in this country. And that tied them to advertising very strongly. If a department store in Kansas City wanted to have a sale on the weekend, there would be an ad in the Kansas City Star on Thursday, or in the case of the New York Times, on Thursday's house and home section. There would be sofa ads for that weekend shopping. Friday would be film, because it was the film openings. Classified ads were even better. People actually paid you to run their copy, which you then sold to someone else. And there was no doubt what a good business it was, double the margins of most Fortune 500 companies, and it could afford to pay for something very expensive, high-quality investigative reporting. Well, the internet comes along and blows away the time and space of information. These gatekeepers really don't have relevance in owning any domain of time and space where information is concerned. They just fall into this vortex of an eternal now of information, if you will. There is no time and space on the internet. <laughs> Craigslist becomes a classified business in early 1999. News sites aggregate other people's expensive work for free. Google, my employer, and Facebook offer new ways to find information, and, sh and everyone discovers shocking new values about what information matters. New digital platforms change work, costs, reading habits, and destroy the margins of the incumbent players. Classified advertising is now down 80% since 2000. Uh, overall advertising revenue is off two-thirds, profitability has fallen even more, newsroom employment has fallen by half, 600 newspapers are gone? It's absolute turmoil. Merchants of Truth is the story of how four companies in the news business find themselves amidst this tumult and their experiences show us how some of the future of our supposedly fact-based democracy is faring. I want to make that story the bulk of today's conversation. But first, <clears throat> we have to speak to the author's own recent experience of real-time journalism. <laughs> Recently, people at one of the publications she profiled, Vice Media, began to point up repertorial inaccuracies in Twitter. And then, and far more troublingly, they tweeted sections of the book that showed direct, uncredited lifts from other publications. Charges of plagiarism spread like wildfire, and charges based on this activity on Twitter became the subject of articles in more conventional publications, such as the Columbia Journalism Review and Pointer. Abramson notes that these six rev references are missing from a catalog of over 835 citations in the book, and that four, in four cases she cites work by the other authors, but I think I'll let you add to this in your own words. What can you say? Well, what I can say is that, you know, I'm sorry that there's a single mistake <coughs> in this book. Uh, you know, I, I worked for over three years on it. You know, I thought I had scrupulously credited any other outside source that I had used. Uh, but, you know, pu publishing is, is very different today than it used to be. And, you know, I was responsible myself as the author for functions like fact-checking, copy editing, indexing, 
and footnotes. And I won't bore you with sort of the get into to the weeds too much, but I was using a system of footnoting called trailing phrase endnotes that, so that the footnotes weren't on the pages where the material uh, appeared. And in one case, uh, I had two things that should have been cited in one paragraph. Uh, and I only, I thought it all was the Washington Post. It wasn't. And in another, I just, you know, was sloppily, uh, did, just didn't notice it. These are not my words. It, it, it was weird because it was another publication quoting a very long piece in Pat Buchanan's magazine, The American Conservative. And because that was named, it didn't occur to me, oh, I got that from something obscure called the Ryerson Review. I feel terrible about both those things. But plagiarism, it was not. I mean, why? Why would I steal the work of others when I credit, you know, almost all of them in some in, in multiple footnotes uh, in other places in the book? All of these uh, problems uh, occur in a small section of the book, which is kind of Vice's early and crazy days, and it's about six six early pages where these footnoting problems happened. And I take responsibility for them. I've you know, said I'm sorry. I've called a number of the authors who were you know, mentioned in the, the tweet that one of Vice's reporters uh, put out there. And uh, you know, I, I, mainly what I did is I corrected all of them immediately. Uh, for the ebook and next version. I mean, that was always Quentin and I were together at the times. And, you know, when a mistake like this was made, you would correct it, you would publish it as a correction, and maybe even an editor's note. And but you'd have a really bad day. You'd have a bad day, but I've uh, had a bad You've had like, a really month. bad, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm going to assume y'all came here to discuss more than whether or not Jill Abramson is a plagiarist. And we're gonna get into the substance of the book. I may return to the way in which this happened because I think it's quite interesting, but let's turn to the book itself. It seems to be in, in stages. There is this moment where, yeah, newspapers lose their lock on their, their economic model, if it will. If they it had will. a monopoly. Yeah, and um, you know, out here, <clears throat> it, uh, they have this term, the innovator's dilemma, when an incumbent encounters a newer and cheaper way of doing what they're doing, and the incumbent is usually blindsided and doesn't know what to do. And you and I both spent years watching the business try to adjust inside an advertising model. It had been basically a little money from subscriptions, but mostly ads, and they, it was so hard for people to understand that online ads were a whole different beast. And there were effectively <clears throat> no cir equivalent of circulation on the internet until recently. It was all advertising based. Yes. Uh, yeah, that started, actually it started here in San Francisco. I remember in 95, SF Gate, the mm -hmm. online version of the Chronicle. I think they actually used the misunderstood Stuart Brand phrase, information wants to be free. Right, that was and said, the let it, original let it all go. sin and tragedy. Right, right. they yeah. could have figured out a payment mechanism then. By the way, the, the second half of that quote involves information wanting to be expensive as well because it's valuable. But tell that to an aggregator who wants to just put together everything that's going on and slap a cheap ad on it, right? And exactly. that's the dominant model. And that's the initial shock. There's this news wants to be free with aggregators and a kind of search for new signals, search engine advertising being right. the key thing. So what happens? Well, what happened is that digital advertising <coughs> never became valuable. It, it stayed as, you know, digital dimes were, you know, a dollar, a dollar fifty in a print ad. So that what every publisher was praying for, which is 
the, the line going down for print advertising, which was really falling off a cliff, that somehow digital advertising would go like this and the lines would cross. Well, you and I might be in the grave by the time those lines uh, cross. It was yeah, I don't like an unrealistic that, <coughs> expectation. And so what had always been two strong revenue streams for newspapers like the New York Times or the Chronicle became, you know, completely dependent on much cheaper digital ads which were plentiful and remain cheap. And, and what you would see in other industries or in other papers was this was a snake that ate its tail <laughs> because there are an infinite number of pages you can put out as the price per ad goes down. You have to put out more and more pages so the quality of the news per force is going to suffer and if there's more and more pages the price for ad is going to drop. You can see where we're going here. We need more pages. The quality's going to drop. The ads just got cheaper because right. there's more pages until you just And, have you know, what you had is you know, truly a, a tragedy in many newsrooms, not first and foremost for the journalists, but for the public who depend on, you mentioned investigative reporting, and enterprise stories to, you know, hold, hold power accountable. Uh, and, you know, that atrophied. Uh, why did investigative reporting start to disappear at most local and regional papers? It's because it, it takes a long time to report an investigative story. That was my field when I was a reporter. I was an investigative reporter. I could spend, you know, four or six months on a story, and it's, it's labor-intensive, mm. it's, it's expensive. And so it was one of the first to go during this period that you're talking about, of digital transition number one was to search engine optimization. Yeah, why was it that, that search became so strong so quickly? Because of where you were, because of Google. Well, I did look that up, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And the New York Times stock price survived the 2000 dot-com crash okay. Its high was $47.07 on April 8th of 2004. Google's S1 comes out on April 29th, which meant the world finally started to understand just how valuable search was. And the Times stock almost travels down in tandem. It dropped down to uh, less than the Sunday paper cost. It, it dropped down to $4. Right. But search was valuable because it was the means to discerning information and people who could figure out how to game that. Right. Which introduces your first character, yes. Jonah Peretti. Uh huh. Who J Jonah per Peretti is the founder and publisher of BuzzFeed, which in its infancy didn't do any news. But what Jonah's specialty was, it, you know, was search engine, uh, how to optimize content for <clears throat> maximum distribution. But he approached it from kind of an acad academic and even social activist point of view. He, it's quite interesting. He's he, like this barefoot guy from Santa Cruz right. who he's likes still, to write papers still, about the you know, Frankfurt School. He's head of a billion dollar plus valued company he still wears like t-shirts with dinosaurs on them. Right. Uh, Very but, cerebral guy. But, but he, you know, he was studying at the MIT uh, Media Lab and was fascinated with how does information get shared? And separately, he ordered uh, a pair of Nike sneakers where he was taking advantage of a special offer where you could have something special written on the sole of your sneaker. And so he ordered his sneakers and wanted them to say sweatshop on the sole. You, so you get it. Nike and had an issue. Nike had an issue. And Jonah kind of kept going up the chain, like and keeping all of the messages he got back with all different reasons, like why they wouldn't make these sneakers sing sweatshop. And at a certain point, he put them all on the internet. Let me just say, and you won't believe what happened next. <laughs> <laughs> 
what happened next will blow your mind. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is, that I was, mean, Quentin was, is making a joke because that, you, you know, and you won't believe what happened next is like the classic BuzzFeed headline. And it's like, is now the classic clickbait yeah. uh, headline, which you'll see on the Washington Pope post apps every once in a while. But anyway, quickly, he put them on the, the web and they millions of people had seen and shared these emails within days. Jonah went on the Today Show. This became a sensation. And so he wanted to replicate that. And he did several other experiments, including a dating uh, site where that you could use to um, auto, through uh, technology, you could automatically break up with someone and not have to talk to them or actually write to them. And so he was one of the original founders of the Huffington Post, and that sold to um, AOL. And Jonah, you know, got a chunk of money and decided he was going to form a company based on social sharing, not on not on search, but on on you know the 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 social platform. Forms like Facebook and Twitter came on, you know, in the 2006, 2007 period, but which is a key. It sounds like a boring year, but it was a key. Bef year. Before we move over to that, we're sort of getting ahead of th this phase. Inside this initial world of search, he's discovered that the catchy headline gets shared and passed on and gets clicked on. That's a very key value in determining how high something will rank. Is our people looking at it is a piece of information. Right. And so that clever headline both feeds the need to get clicks and sell ads, but also raises the likelihood someone searching will do this. Right. And, and in a way, sorry. You know, what he discovered is that emotional content, especially things that bring a smile to your face, are you know the most shareable things, kitten which listicle. led to adorable puppy photos and kitten photos. Right, right. Uh, or which tyrant are you? Everybody got Hitler. Right. <coughs> um, which dis Which Disney princess are you? I mean that that yeah, was one of the strange the quizzes kind of too. Uh, and obviously this is very far away from news, but he had a very um, sure sense of who the audience for this uh, content would be. And he called his audience the Board at Work Network. Uh, it was, you know, younger people sitting at screens at their job who, when the boss wasn't looking, were opening their Facebook, you know, news feed and looking for distraction. And I think what's interesting about this initial section is it surfaces how n the news business is searching for kind of fundamental values with its economics destroyed, it's sort of figuring out what we're about. And it turns out what news is about is immediacy, the kind of thing Reuters and AP used to master, but everybody wanted a scoop. But then also authority, is this actually true? And BuzzFeed wasn't so good for that, but the Times would be great for that. Exactly. When the Boston bombing happened, the Times got a lot of traffic because they wanted to know things that were true, not just, you know, what's getting passed around. And context is But I mean, thing. it's an interesting example, and we are getting way ahead <laughs> of the story. But, you know, BuzzFeed's main contribution to the Boston bombing was its incredible skill and the speed at which it could find the social... Uh, postings right, of right, right. This is what um, and that they 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 got a couple of scoops off of social media, and so it would be velocity, and it would be a kind of edge or intensity to the velocity. What we you know, what editors at the paper, you know, at the Journal and in the Times both would say, give me a no shit moment, you know, inside this story, make my jaw drop, you know, and that was something conventional news did as well. But the need for that to make people click just went up exponentially. That's true. Which is sort of where Shane Smith and, and Vice come in. Right. You know, because that was the original jaw-dropping kind of news. They the, were sensationalists. The, the reason, first of all, ju just 
for a little bit of background. The, I, the reason I wanted to follow four uh, news companies, two of the new shiny digital upstarts, BuzzFeed and Vice, and two um, great legacy newspapers, the New York Times and the Washington Post. I was copying, does some of you remember a great book by David Halberstam called The Powers That Be? <laughs> It followed, you know, four companies at the zenith of the press's power and profits. And, you know, it was fascinating, you know, history of CBS and Time Magazine and the Washington Post and the LA Times. So what I wanted to do is do a narrative about this incredibly disruptive, full of turmoil, uh, dis digital disruption. And I thought the story I was telling was how these two new upstarts benefited from it and actually became serious news providers. And I thought I was telling the gyrations and difficulties of the old legacy companies trying to become digital first on a very short time span. But and the rules keep changing. The, I mean, the thing is, ne never write a book about you know the news media because it always changes, but what I was told the reporters who worked for me at the Times uh, was you've got to go into every story with a willingness to be surprised. And mm -hmm. boy, did I get a surprise. Right. And Vice was important. I doubt many of you watch Vice News. Uh, they have a, a nightly show on HBO, a weekly show, and a website called Vice News. But it started in the late 90s in Montreal as a lad mag. It was for, you know, young men, basically. It was pretty... Uh, dirty it was you know it it wrote about extreme covered extreme sports and skateboarding and things that were interesting it was a it was a con an ongoing tribute to passing out with your shirt off right <laughs> <laughs> typically in a country where you didn't speak the language yeah <clears throat> but they also started doing these kind of gonzo travelogues, like Shane Smith, who was the Jonah Peretti of Vice, the creator and founder. He, he snuck into North Korea to do it. They went to far-flung places that weren't covered. And one day, he was at lunch with the movie director Spike Jones, who became the creative director of Vice and is a director of movies like Being John Malkovich, Adaptation, The Orchid Thief, yeah. uh, really good director. And he was um, at a lunch skateboard filmmaker. with Shane, who is a world-class and famous BS artist. And <laughs> And uh, Spike Jones said to him, well, you're of course sending someone with a video camera with your reporter when you do these stories. And Shane said, oh yeah, of course. And then well, he, he went was then. racing, no he wasn't, he went racing back to the Williamsburg yes. office and bought video equipment. But Vi Vice's importance as a company uh, <clears throat> is that it, it, it got on to video much earlier than any other digital startup. And honestly, you know, uh, they, they and, took that, sorry. And we now have been told for years, you, you, the cliche in our industry is the pivot to video, that for a long time it was assumed video, which attracts higher ad premiums, was going to be the savior of news. But they, so. you know, in, in credit to them, they took that, passing out drunk energy and turned it into some really amazing footage. It didn't have the context, typically I'm talking about, but it had the no shit dimension. Their, yeah, their style, um, you know, they, they did get into broadcast TV and when they pitched HBO on doing a TV show, which would be news from the edge in all of these like, you know, third world hot spots. Uh, they described it as jackass meets 60 minutes. 
Yes. Uh, it and was that's more than, what it was. More than 10 so. years ago, I saw the stuff they did about the kids in Colombia who live in the sewers. Yeah, one of my leave characters. Leave the cops did, yeah. and, you know, live on Buzzco. And it was fantastic. And but, the Times wasn't offering that. Right. It was amazingly good. But their style, good. the jackass meets 60 Minutes style, was called immersionism. It didn't have like a correspondent doing vice, um, doing voiceover. There's no host. Uh, the style, you know, immersionism made you feel watching these pieces that you were crawling through the sewers with their correspondent, who was a young guy for the, the Columbia story named Thomas Morton, whose nickname at Vice is Baby Balls. And, and you know, the, the style was as he like went through the sewer wearing, you know, boots and trudged through the mud and worse than mud, he's saying things like, oh, wow. I'm scared. You know, it's like it kind of puts you on the, the edge of your yeah, seat. Yeah, it's almost it's so. the same kind of I'm so fixated energy as clickbait only in this newsy kind of context. Right. And that actually has evolved in some ways very well. They did fantastic work in the Crimean election, for example. Right. Going places that conventional Simon media wasn't Ostrovsky, going. Simon Ostrovsky, yeah. fantastic work. But they also made some kind of rookie mistakes. They did a big piece on what they called the drunkest place on earth. It was a, a, a story about Uganda, but it turned out Uganda wasn't the drunkest pa place on earth. <laughs> there were several countries that had higher Vastly rates Vastly drunker. Of Alcohol can shakily raise their <laughs> hands, saying, <laughs> Right, yeah, but so that kind of set the stage, right? And we haven't the gotten times, them into news, and we no. might just want to talk about yeah. why, when they're doing mainly sort of entertainment or infotainment, why do they both want to do news? And they both get into news at about the same time. BuzzFeed added news in 2012, Vice in 2013. And they do it for a number of reasons. By this time, they've grown audience, uh, audiences of very big scale. And they want to kind of upclass both their advertising and their audience. And news is one way to do that. You're going to get a better educated, maybe more affluent, uh, readers or viewers. Mm -hmm. So it's a business decision. Uh, so, and then, they, <laughs> they are getting this velocity. Let's talk about the Times and the Post as we move into the next phase of this, which is the arrival of Facebook and social as a conveyance of news, which Jonah absolutely masters. And to some extent, Vice is doing. Yeah, I mean, basically, an easy way to think about it is that BuzzFeed <coughs> was built on the back of Facebook. BuzzFeed wouldn't have become a big deal without Facebook. Facebook was effectively its publishing system. Yes. And for Vice, it was YouTube, which was bought by Google in 2006. Yeah, and they both understood that it was one thing to land a story, but you had to make it highly shareable. Right, but Vice doesn't have to own like a broadcast network. No. And, and BuzzFeed doesn't really care whether you look at its posts on buzzfeed.com or on Facebook or later Pinterest or Snapchat. You just have to tee up the story so right. people are interested in passing it on in some ways for the status points they get by doing that. Because they, they become newspaper cool. peddlers. Right. Yeah. And but let, let's do talk about the Post. And let's the talk Post. about the conventional papers. How are they handling all this? And well, they're, they're struggling to adjust. And I had a front row seat at the Times because I was managing editor and then executive editor 2003 to 2014. So this, th this is the, the period of time w of the struggle. And 
the yeah the 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 times is used to a newspaper culture and newspaper rhythm where really the reporters get to report all day on one story and your rhythms and deadlines are set by the printing press when the paper has to go to the printing press suddenly with the internet you know stories can be published anytime anywhere and you have a hugely speeded up news cycle and the expectation of most readers becomes, especially once Apple introduces the iPhone in 2007, that they're going to know like what happened the instant it happens. You yes. know, all of you get those breaking news alerts. I mean, the expectation now is you're going to know it when it's happening, yes, not and after it's happening. Yes, the the context and the authority, this was, less you know, a very traumatic philosophy. change at both the New York Times and the Washington Post, which actually created separate newsrooms for web and print, and that, of course, made adjusting to this new digital first culture even more difficult. The Washington Post. WashingtonPost.com was in a different state. It was across the river, Potomac River in Virginia. And at the Times, you probably remember the, the, web, the web people, that's what they mm -hmm. were called. Uh, Lesser the, form as if of they life. were Martians, yeah. you know, working you know, about seven blocks down on, on Broadway. But, you know, the, the, the print editors and reporters felt like they're not going to take story assignments from the web editor. This is so classic It was very du duplicative, you know, needlessly expensive, and it slowed us down, like, horribly. Yeah. And, and we are in this classic innovator's dilemma mindset where the really big incumbents can't envision a world where they aren't as relevant as they used to. Right. I arrived at the Times in 2011, in part because it was pioneering subscriptions. And what but I think neither, I mean, what's kind of interesting about the fact that the Washington Post didn't get really get social platforms is that Don Graham was on the board of Facebook and he met uh, Zuckerberg like when he w had just sort of dropped out of Harvard, he was a friend of another student uh, at Harvard who Graham knew. And, you know, Graham was, he thought the Facebook, as it was called then, was he told me he thought it was the single best business idea he had ever heard. And he made a handshake deal with Zuckerberg to invest and get 10% of Facebook. And you know, th this is in a, uh, th this anecdote, and I fully credit it, is in David Kirkpatrick's book about Facebook, but uh, Zuckerberg got another offer uh, that was higher, and he agonized, like he has this handshake deal with Don Graham, what is he gonna do? He feels terrible. He actually is at a restaurant with his partners, goes to the men's room and is crying on the floor. And one of his colleagues comes and finds him and says, just call Don Graham and tell him the situation. And Don Graham is one of the nicest people, you know, certainly in the news business, maybe in any business. And when Zuckerberg called him, he said, don't worry about it, Graham said, yeah, I'm letting you out of our deal. Now, if he hadn't done that, the Washington Post would have been, you know, bathing in huge amounts of money forevermore and wouldn't have had to worry a bit about all of the problems we are talking about. Mm -hmm. But what the Times and the, the Post didn't get is that with, with the advent of the Facebook news feed and that becoming the dominant way that most Americans saw news, that like 
promoting your stories on social media became effectively part of the publishing process. Yes. But, you know, basically, for most of my career at the Times, you plan a story as an editor, you kibitz with the reporters and get it to the point where it can be printed on the printing press or, you know, go up on the homepage of, of the website. But there was this whole after part that was creating like a much wider audience for news stories. And like both companies were kind of missed the social way. As, as you said, you say, most times editors barely noticed when competitors had a scoop unless it was the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal. And that was true. And that's one reason um, in 2001, the Times went too far with Iraq. McClatchy was saying other things, but it just didn't get the throw it, weight it should have. And also, McClatchy, interestingly enough, does not have a newspaper in Washington. Right, their friends so, weren't reading it, so um, they weren't. Or they weren't seeing the story, you know, yeah. stories at, at the Times in the Washington Bureau. But so the doubts about WMD basically were never during surfing. this, you know, decade of turmoil. <laughs> The, the Post and the Times are slow to realize that, like, many readers don't want editors sitting in, you know, rooms in New York and Washington deciding the hierarchy of what news is important. The language They want to, they, yeah, they trust their friends and family more. And, and they start so calling they like, the editors the gatekeepers who have to get out of the way. And they don't want them anymore. Yeah, they don't want uh, them. And in the midst of this, and it's another interesting division in the book, the old model was very, very likely to create dynastic families, the Chandlers in L.A. There was a, there was a Kentucky paper. The Hearst. Pa the Hearst. I mean, there was a Kentucky paper. There was a, a Chicago family. And at the Times and the Post, you've got two dynastic families without getting into the somewhat, well, it's not nepotism because they also own shares majorly, but having that single family view, is the stewardship a help or does it blind you to the, how much the world is changing? I think both, but I think it's more of a help because, you know, our, the Salzberger <coughs> family and the Graham family, they, they were fabulous stewards of those newspapers in terms of the journalism. I mean, they <clears throat> never let an advertiser influence anything. Uh, what they weren't uh, good at is seeing the coming trends and changes in the industry. I mean, Punch Salzberger, who was the father of the publisher I work for, bought the Boston Globe for over a billion dollars uh, in the, the late 90s. And he thought, oh, I'm going to have this great monopoly of, it, you know, of the elite world from New York up the New England corridor. And he made that purchase at precisely the moment newspapers and advertising were going like yeah, this. Yeah, all those values so, have gone away. So you know, that's that's why it's both. And Don Graham, uh, besides losing out on Facebook, uh, he decided he'd been he he had served in Vietnam after college, and he'd become a DC cop. Uh, and he was a cop for a couple of years, and he just loved the city of Washington. I mean, more than his regal mother, who, you know, was not part and parcel of the life of D.C., but Don was, and he was very committed to keeping the Washington Post locally focused, and that turned out to not be a wise decision because all of the department stores in Washington closed, like local advertising for them went like this. And on the web, local doesn't quite work because you instantly had a global audience and the ability of advertisers to reach people around the globe, and they didn't necessarily want the Washington, D.C. market. No, the, the new model is... Incredible loyalty, or massive scale, or subsidized. Or 
news that is of such a unique quality it can't be found anywhere else subscription and so letters you can make it expensive and ask digital readers to pay for it's it. sort of like what, what wall street analysis used to be only different niches and that takes us into this third stage well actually i, I sh we have to mention the dress okay <laughs> because we're going back to buzzfeed everyone <laughs> well no it's um uh, it's the social business the other thing about the incumbents is before they could ignore the competition, and now you have to be aware of what's going on on the internet and talk about what's going on on the internet. Even when it's when pretty it's, silly. Even when it's what color is the dress. Right. The, the dress was BuzzFeed posted on, on, at night just a picture of a dress that the mother of the bride was going to be wearing at a wedding, I think somewhere in Scotland. And to some people, it looked, it was a striped dress, like it was blue and black. And other people looked at it and were sure it was white and gold. So BuzzFeed posted a picture of the dress, and all it said is, what color is this dress? And, you know, it went mega vi, as they call it, at, at BuzzFeed. You know, viral is what they like their post to 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 be and go but mega vi like millions and millions and within like about four days 26 million people had clicked on that story and well yeah. and that story was covered in the new york times it absolutely like, in yeah. by the business section yeah sure. uh, yeah you'd find a way into it because it's a phenomenon right i want to circle back to your recent experience okay. here because these why because i'm wearing black and blue i thought it was white and gold <laughs> uh, no because if the value is velocity and if people write about what's being written about i think your re recent experience with people calling you out in plagiarism and you saying no i was i wrote it in a hurry and i was in an it environment was a footnote problem yeah, it was a footnote that. problem we were in a hurry you know, we didn't stop maybe as much as we should have. And then people write about you on Twitter and that becomes viral. And then that gets written about because it's being written about on Twitter. You're kind of living part of the problem. Well, I felt like I was reading part of my book, uh, which is, you know, an exploration of virality and how, you know, information spreads but you know what happened is on the the plagiarism uh one of vice's correspondents uh named michael moynihan went on twitter and posted these six short passages like jill's version and then the original ver version which i had not in four cases correctly footnoted to the page and in two had missed and wow i was scheduled to go on a tv news program and i knew that this had happened i had not had time i only had my phone with me to really look at it to even understand what it was. Footnote, so, it was Fox she was going on. Huh? You were on Fox. I right? was on Fox. Yeah. Uh, so that was great. And I could see that Martha McCallum, who was going to interview me, was like writing very fast. She did not even say hello to me. Uh, I sat down and, you know, that was, she was asking me about the, these, these tweets and, or this one tweet. And, you know, all I really had absorbed in this amount of time was that it was plagiarism. And I did say, you know, I didn't plagiarize. I would not steal someone else's work in 40 years in, in the profession. Why would I start doing that now? But I hadn't even had time to sit and look. And by the time I, I, I stayed at Fox, they basically the, the cleaning crew was in i was sitting on the floor you know going over this and by then you know really i think at least 15 news organizations had called either me or simon and schuster for comment off this this yeah. tweet so 
so. uh, started almost immediately. You were living your subject. <laughs> I was. And now, I mean, to, to tie up and get to questions, very much of which have to do with the present day, um, the age of Trump is kind of the third part of this. Right. And how everyone's coping suddenly with the new problematic nature of truth itself and almost voting for truth or declaring things fake news. You've, you, the subscriptions at the New York Times took off right after Trump was elected, almost what, as a vote against Trump. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that in the <clears throat> first couple of days at both the Washington Post, the New York Times, and a lot of other news organizations, the public was mad. Like Times subscribers were mad because they felt that the Times had missed the Trump story. And do you remember on the Times' homepage, it was called the Hell Dial. It looked like a speedometer. And it leaned like 85% towards a Hillary Clinton win, you know, by massaging and doing data analysis of polls. And so, you know, everyone woke up to this, the unthinkable had happened. Trump was president and actually the readers started canceling subscriptions and, and there was concern about that, enough so that S Arthur Salzberger Jr. and Dean Baquet, the, the executive editor, wrote a note to readers sort of pledging to, you know, once again, you know, stay true to, you know, f all that the time stands for, news without fear or favor. Uh, and, you know, we're worried about their losing, losing subscribers. But then the next week, and I'm not saying this is why, but it interested me. John Oliver did a show, which was F.U. 2016. And at the end of it, he gave like a really rousing, probably the best speech anyone has given about the importance of the press and of quality news. And he called out the Times, the Washington Post, and ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative journalism group. I, I'm on the board of it. But, and I mean, donations started pouring into ProPublica and orders for digital subscriptions started going through the roof. Uh, in 2016 alone, the Times, to 17, the Times had added a million new digital subscribers. And the, the Times and the Post both ride this. The Post, by having this democracy dies in darkness. Right. You know, we're, we're carriers of the truth. And the Times with an uh, ad campaign that says the truth is. The truth is. is hard. The truth is hard. The truth is all these. Like, they're becoming this standard against which fake news well, is Well, you know, I think that... that they're responding also directly to President Trump and his litany of tweets and speeches where, you know, he's singling out the failing New York Times, which was hardly failing. They were mm -hmm. making a ton of money off of him. But... Um, you know, and calling them fake news, calling the Washington Post the Amazon Washington Post, because in 2013, you all know Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, but he bought it personally. And it, yes. It's not part and of Amazon. And injects a lot of good technology. But that too, you know, <clears throat> fake news, fake news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and ironically, Jonah Peretti, who is about as postmodern as it gets, <laughs> you know, where, you know, truth is supposed to be elusive. Um, along with Vice, is starting to suffer as a business in all this environment. Yeah, the people Times and the Post are riding high, and there are layoffs at these other publications now. Yeah, we're in the right now now because that's absolutely true. Yeah. It didn't like start immediate. Wasn't that linked yeah. to uh, to Trump? But maybe in some sense it was because you know a lot of people became more serious about the news suddenly, yeah. and you, you know the ratings for the network news programs and especially for the cable shows like went through the roof too. I mean, news be suddenly became a big money maker when it had been a loss leader at a lot of places. So 
you'd like to conclude that... And wait, and <coughs> Vice and BuzzFeed just announced uh, 250 staff layoffs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and not yeah. that things are great elsewhere. Gannett is laying off, and I mean, yeah, and there's Gannett still a house may, You know, has a hostile takeover bid. Yeah. Uh, and the um, the way in which we write news, the way we should think I, about I news, but I think has we need to tw dwell on a little bit on Trump and his assault on truth and on the press because it's it's really a dangerous thing and not only because you know a few reporters have been you know hurt and attacked at Trump rallies but because it undermines you know the the mission of journalism and a free press. And the founders of our country were so worried about abusive, over-centralized authority that they enshrined, you know, a free press in the First Amendment, which is first for a reason. And to... Uh, <coughs> and, you know, Trump is trying to completely undermine that. And to uh, pick up on a reader, uh, uh, audience question, you know, Michelle Wolf at the uh, right. press club last year at the, the press dinner said, <clears throat> y'all are kind of addicted to him. He's really good for business. She can't stop. Wait. Yeah. She added like a funny punchline to yeah. that. She looked out at all the reporters and she said, I think you want to date him. Yes. <laughs> so the, reader, the audience member asked, is media coverage fueling his agenda and actually making him stronger? By having this nonstop staring Addiction at him, to, yeah, to Trump, him and his tweets, but he is the president, so you know he how do is you see the it? president. But he also Trump in a headline <clears throat> draws a huge audience, and you know I don't think obviously that the <clears throat> Washington Post or the New York Times is covering Trump and investigating Trump and doing so many stories just because he gets lots of clicks right. and makes money for him. But, you know, I I implicitly it's true that they do get a ton of clicks and make money off of, like, all of these Trump stories. And sometimes on, on the Washington Post app, I'm like with my thumb going down like two screens before I get to anything that isn't Trump. And, and on both the, Trump, the Times and the Post, you very quickly come to editorial. You know, an opinion about Trump is high up in the coverage instead of analytic coverage and the opinion further down the way it might have been in a newspaper. Yeah, that's true on the Post app. Not, the, the Times still keeps it pretty separated. I read it but, on a tablet and uh -huh. it's over there. <clears throat> but where I really see a, a danger is, since I was mentioning cable TV, is now every good reporter in Washington and every good White House reporter has like a very lucrative six-figure contract to be on tap for CNN mm -hmm. or MSNBC uh, and I suppose also you know Fox You're for sure. uh, reporters for conservative uh, news organizations but you know the <coughs> the reporters appear on these panels with like partisan Democratic consultants or former prosecutors who have like very out there opinionated views. And, you know, maybe the reporter tries to, you know, have a tamer phrasing, but I think the average viewer, it blurs, and it just seems like, you know, a, a real pile-on. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm often surprised that the reporters I used to follow, because I now have completely gotten off Twitter. Oh, is that? Uh, um, you know, they, they voice clear anti-Trump opinion mm -hmm. on Twitter. Sure. And, you know, when I was editor, I used to say, on social media and television, I expect you to observe the same standards as you would if you're writing a story. And while we end up in the book and in the present day saying the Post and the Times are doing well, people are subscribing, there is this kind of, you know, 
triumph of truth in a way, but there's also this enormous presence of fake news. That may not be durable. There may be a part four and five coming, right? Of course it's there will be. It's not over. I mean, nobody still knows what's how information after, flows. And also what's going to happen after Trump. Right. Do you think, or is there some way to steer and fix things, or do we just have to wait to see what happens? Well, now? you know, you have to discern. I'm a, 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 an optimist, and, you know, I think there's a human need for great storytelling and quality information, and I feel very confident that, you know, the Times, <coughs> the Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Guardian, where I write, uh, yeah, that the 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 sort of global news organizations are going to survive. The ones that have gotten whacked and that, you know, I think it's a national tragedy are local uh, newspapers uh, and even the regional newspapers that used to be high quality yeah, have been stripped down for parts and you know 600 papers you know yeah. have have closed and you know we haven't talked about public trust in the news but you know it's at a very low point and local newspapers were the most trusted always because the editor is a no known person around town and the reporter who covers the city council or zoning board is someone they see in the supermarket. You talk about so. investing in investigative reporters. That was investing in someone who sat at every school board meeting for two right. years Forget and picked it. up that an anomaly. And anymore. How this and driveway got paved. And yeah. that small scale corruption and that small scale cynicism really aggregates to a bigger problem. Yes, which than the is the corrosion stuff. of democracy. Right. And I don't think anybody's figured out how to fix no that. No one has figured that out. Although here in San Francisco, there was an initiative to add local news pages. At the Times, we we did some local news. It was years ago, was when I was managing editor. And But it doesn't, these local, these quality local non nonprofits mainly, uh, there are ones in Texas, there's a good one in Minneapolis. They don't they're great, but they don't begin to fill the void. Shout to my friends at Berkeley side doing a fine job, but there is no model you can transport to Fresno and Reno and yeah, well Orem that, and everywhere else in the country. In essence is, you know, the, the frightening thing. Even though I'm an optimist, there is no still no certain business model that sustains and supports the best news gathering. Right now, you know, it looks like reader revenue is the answer for, you know, the, the, the two papers I wrote about. But, mm -hmm. you know, just constant change. And I think the last quarter the <clears throat> at the Times, they, they established, uh, oh, they had $709 million in digital revenue, $4.3 million paying which is great because it happened away from an election, a major election. And but I know they're worried about what happens Trump when Trump bomb. is gone. Yeah, they're, they're still worried probably a little bit about how do you turn them into regular consumers across the country? And they have to work on that one. Uh, a reader, an audience question, excuse me. I know you're all readers. Um, <laughs> <coughs> had you been running the Times during the 2016 election, how would you have covered Trump and Clinton differently? I'm benefit sorry. of hindsight. How would you have covered Trump and Clinton differently in 2016? Do you think the Times dropped the ball or were they behaving appropriately? Well, I, I'll just kind of repeat what I, I wrote in the book. I think that the Times went overboard on Hillary Clinton's email. <coughs> uh, you know, they, they covered it like it was Watergate. And, you know, it, it did not turn out to be, you know, a criminal matter. And, you know, they, they did, you know, so many stories on it. Do you think and the Times really believed its own meter? Trump's not going to get elected. We have to tee this you know, up for it, a Clinton it, it presidency. You know, I think that, that that may have been a factor. I think that the Times wanted to show because they thought she was going to win, that they were, you know, ha but, you know, directing scrutiny at the Democratic 
candidate who was more in tune with <coughs> the paper's editorial policy. And I think it's just old fashioned. They had a scoop. They broke that story that she had a private server and they just wrote it and wrote it and wrote it. And so, you know, I think that that, that really, really, you know, hurt Hillary Clinton, as did obviously Comey reopening uh, right. the the um, the investigation so close to election day. But take a look at like the actual front page of the Times, like the d day after Comey did reopen it. I mean, that's all that's on there, mm -hmm. and you know that that kind of thing <coughs> didn't help her. For Trump, you know, I would have tried to restore, you know, old, more old fashioned shoe leather reporting, sending the political reporters out in the country the stuff to on talk the to voters. Because fantastic. obviously what many news organizations, not just the Times miss, was this tide, you know, growing waves of anger among especially white male voters, you know, who lived in parts of the country, you know, red America, where they felt, you know, in a economy that seemed to be thriving, they were losing out. I was um, in a, I was at a Christmas store. And they were store. detached, you know, from that. When, when I was editor of the Times, we opened new bureaus in Phoenix and Kansas City because we did have a sense that we needed more news from, you know, the mi middle red America. But the, those had been shuttered after for 2016 they didn't I suppose the lesson here for statistics people is when it says 84 85 percent probability that's still a one in six chance the Correct. other thing's going to happen and unless you're a big fan of Russian roulette pay attention to the one in six chance right you know and it was then always there the, the, he could win you know the question which I'm now exploring I, I teach two journalism seminars which is there were bits and pieces of the Russia meddling and potential ties to the <coughs> Trump campaign before Election Day, but almost nothing came out. And in retrospect, that, that seems a pity. Not but just because I think it's information that voters deserve to know about. Okay. At a time when people increasingly question news from sources they typically disagree with, what is your take on the New York Times hiring of Sarah Jiang and the in impact of her incendiary comments on the New York Times? This gets back to what oh, you were saying about people, reporters tweeting. Yeah, um, which I've already said, opinionated yeah. tweeting is a bad idea. But, you know, Facebook plays a huge role in siloing the audience for news because the almighty algorithm, and Quentin can explain it better than me, find, you know, it values what you click on and what you share. So what you like and what you share. And so it keeps feeding you what you like they think you'll like and what you'll share. And for political news, that tends to be, you know, news that reflects your political outlook, uh, either on the left or the right. Uh, and that has intensified what the audience member is talking about, is the fact that people, 63% of Americans see news through their Facebook news feed, and mostly if they do have appointed political outlook, they're seeing, you know, news stories that match that and only that. Audience member asks, would you be willing to let artificial intelligence do investigative reporting? <laughs> Good question. Not now. <laughs> well, I think we have time for one final question. And it falls to me, uh, you know, given your experience of the past several weeks, you've had an exceptional career, 45 years, fantastic stories, led this amazing news organization, and in the last month had this experience of being this journalism pinata. <laughs> um, <clears throat> are you glad you wrote the book? Was it worth it? I, I, I feel it was worth it. I think the book, 
you know, got fantastic reviews. The Financial Times called it a masterwork. The New York Times gave it a very strong review. And many people have said it's a worthy successor to the powers that be. So despite, you know, we, we live in a period where, you know, what's happening right now seems so colossally big and important, but you know, it fades and, you know, I'm going to continue with my great career and, you know, I'm going to be as proud of this book, you know, a year from now as I was when I finished it. And in the spirit of news you can use, what are two or three things we can do, the audience can do to make the news business better? Uh, read and pay for what you read. <laughs> Uh, that's number one. Uh, make sure that you do sometimes see news that isn't reflective of your politics. Uh, and there are some good sites. Apple News actually goes out of its way to, you know, have some variety. Expose yourself to different points of view, and uh, don't believe everything that you see on Twitter. <laughs> Jill Abramson, thank you so much. Um, that concludes this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. I'm going to be signing. Jill will be signing books in the back. Don't leave. Get the book. <laughs> She will be signing. And that concludes our meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know. Thank you. <laughs>